I'm Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, May 12th. After considering more than 600 pieces of legislation for 120 days, lawmakers have closed out the 2023 Colorado legislative session. And one of the more graceful things to come out of it was our colleague, regular Colorado Inside Out panelist, Marianne Goodland, playing the harp on the last day of the session with the hope of calming some of the tense crowd at the Capitol. That was early in the day on Monday. It was a trying four months, I think we all agree. There is a lot to discuss this week, so let me introduce to you our panel. We have Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, David Kopel, research director at the Independence Institute, as well as Krista Kafer, columnist for the Denver Post, and Eric Sonderman, columnist for Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette and Colorado Springs Gazette. Where to begin on how this 2023 legislative, legislative session ended, Patty? Well, you know you're told not to watch legislation being made just the way you're not supposed to watch sausage being made. I haven't figured out what kind of sausage has been made from this session. Everything happened so fast at the end after a fairly leisurely pace to start out that we had amendments flying. We had bills being killed at the last second, like the, the land use bill, which I'm sure will come up again. But, you know, Governor Polis's big move. We have ballot measures we're going to be talking about in November for property tax. This was a lot of sausage being made, and we don't know how tasty it's going to be. <laughs> David, we haven't seen you in a couple weeks. I am very yeah. curious to hear your thoughts on how this session ended. Well, the, the chaos at the end of the session was the result of terribly bad management by the majority party leadership. The House and Senate rules say that you're supposed to have all your, your bills introduced by certain deadlines. And the, in the normal order of things, the last one uh, comes in around January 25th. This year, in what must have been a record, over half the bills were late bills. That is grossly irresponsible on the part of the Democratic leadership in each house uh, to have allowed those, and it's their fault uh, that this chaos resulted at the end. Half of them, wow. Yeah. Krista. You know, when I think of this sausage, I want to become a vegetarian. Um, this was a <laughs> terrible, terrible session. We had a, a land bill where they were going to take away zoning authority for lo localities. Luckily, that got stripped from the bill, but then the House got mad because they were like, well, we can't have our bill neutered. So that gelding never actually made it over the finish line. We also have lawmakers going after the free speech rights of pregnancy centers, people who work there to share good news with women that, that want to... Uh, you know, stop an abortion that's happening with a reversal pill. We've got that. We've got forcing taxpayers to pay for abortions through their insurance premiums. Ridiculous. I think all of those are going to be countered in court and be overturned, luckily. We've also got that, what I'm calling the Rob Peter to pay Peter property tax bill, where you just say, oh, look, I'm going to take away your your Tabor refund, and then I'm going to give it back to you, um, not you know, to try to offset some of this property tax relief. So it's it's a, it's a bit of a shell game, a bit of a con game, if I can think of a, a better a better uh, simile. I, I think it would involve swearing, so I won't actually go with it. But I think it was a lousy session. I think they went for our pocketbooks and also uh, went after our First Amendment rights. It was not a well-managed session. It is a lousy way to run a railroad, and it doesn't need to be this way. Yes, there's always going to be a rush at the end. Procrastination is somewhat human nature, but it doesn't have to be to this extent, partially, as David pointed out, due to the plethora of late bills. Uh, partially, and I think the governor has some responsibility in this, as well as leadership, the worst kept secret in the state has been that there's going to be this property tax crisis because of exploding assessments, Gallagher Amendment going away, et cetera. Everyone known, has known this was coming, and yet they chose to wait until two and a half days before the end of the session to even roll out a proposal. There's no way that got the kind of scrutiny that it deserves. I know we're going there with the next topic, mm -hmm. but that is not the way to run a railroad or a legislature. Yeah. Well, they did still have two hours, so I'm sure they could have rewritten it and passed it. They ended at 10 instead of midnight, so. So you mentioned it, but this was not the way Governor Polis wanted this to turn out with his big affordable housing plan. Well, and what you wonder about is Polis is a smart politician, so he had to know what kind of concern this would raise, you know, that you had people in agreement, Eastern Plains, 
urban cities, everyone was upset, except maybe a few developers and maybe one or two others, was upset that local control was going to be lost. I think and, and the fact that they still tried to resurrect it at the end and even made more of a mess. Yeah. Messy I, sausage. I, I guess I would add into this, I think this is what happens when you have one party government and particularly one party government with those kinds of huge majorities. It, it breeds a kind of arrogance and I do think it bred an arrogance in this uh, case that we can ram these kinds of things through, we can overcome arguments of local control, et cetera. One party government is bad, whether it's one party government on the hard left or the hard right. Mm -hmm. I talked to two mayors when I was writing a column about this, one on the left, one on the right. Both of them hated that change, uh, the, that proposal um, to eliminate authority from local districts to do their own zoning. I mean, Littleton took a good year to go over its, old, you know, its zoning from the 80s and uh, it would just uh, wipe away all that hard work. I, you, you guys are too harsh because <laughs> it, it's true that the governor's bill to cram in density and, and subsidize high density development in certain areas with everybody else's money, that didn't pass. But the legislature did another major step to make housing more unaffordable, which is they passed a bill, the only bill in the country like this, that says if you have apartments, even as, as something as, as few as a five-unit complex, and then you want to sell it, and you have a deal to sell it, then the local government can step in and say, oh, maybe we want to buy it for affordable, that is government-run housing, and they can take months or more to do it. So people will buy, choose to build in the other 49 states uh, that don't have this. So don't say the legislature hasn't done anything important on housing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the property tax issue, shall we now? Because two bills designed to provide some relief from our enormous property taxes are expected to be signed into law, but it will be Colorado voters who will have the final say in November. David, I'm going to start with you on this. This is the sleaziest thing Governor Polis has ever done in his public career, which has been mostly honorable, I would say. They put on the ballot last year something to repeal the, the Gallagher Amendment. That ballot referendum began without raising taxes. Well, that was an outright lie, and they knew that, because although it wouldn't change the nominal property tax rate, it would drastically change how the, the calculation that precedes that of what, what's your assessment for valuation. And so they knew the minute it passed that property taxes were going to skyrocket, uh, particularly for residential. So that no surprise at all. If they wanted to do something about that, the time to get to work on that was November of last year, and then they could have talked to people and had a bill uh, ready to go on the first day of the legislative session. And by the way, they were so incompetent in how they rushed it, they said this has to be Proposition HH on the ballot. Well, HH has already been taken mm -hmm. up by another initiative uh, improve, approved by the Secretary of State's office. So they can't even get the alphabetization uh, correct on this. So I think it was Rahm Emanuel that said, never let a crisis go to waste. They've been wanting to go after Tabor for a while. They knew this was going to happen when they got rid of Gallagher, that we would see these spikes in valuations. Mine went up 57%, uh, which means I'm going to see substantially more in uh, a, a bigger bill, right? And, you know, I'm an adjunct professor, so think, you know, S Starbucks employee minus the benefits and the free okay. coffee, right? Anyone who is not wealthy is going to, uh, that, that owns a home, even a little tiny house, is going to struggle because of, of the repeal of Gallagher. They knew this all along, but rather than fix it, rather than even vote for a Republican proposal, which they killed in committee, that said that, 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 but it, that just put a modest cap on the increase, um, they, they, they shot that down and then rolled into the last week of the session with the crisis that they have been wanting since Tabor was passed, and that is basically to eliminate it in this way. And so it's, it's disingenuous. Um, it is, as, as uh, she said, it's, a, it's basically a con. Um, and, it, and it gives voters two really bad options, which is, oh, go ahead and, you know, go ahead and pay higher property taxes or get a tiny bit of relief by sacrificing your Tabor refund. So in, in essence, hiking income taxes to help with property taxes, which is why I call it Rob Peter to pay Peter. And I think it is, uh, it's the shame uh, of this particular legislative session. I think it's gonna be fascinating how this election unfolds. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, two thoughts. Number one, I remember a year ago when we had to quote Colorado cash back, where in the middle of an election campaign, we all got these checks. Uh, and Governor Polis at that point in time accused anyone who questioned the motives of doing this in the middle of an election campaign of cynicism. Well, I think we know where the cynicism is in this case. We're now a year after that election, or half a year after that election. The governor safety re -elect, safely reelected. Democrats increased their majorities. And now, of course, there's no cash back. It just comes a year from now. They're trying to take money out of that refund to fund, quote, property tax relief. Chris has a great line. I wish I knew, knew who this Peter guy was, but it's a great. <laughs> um, um, it, it, it's a great line. So the cynicism is very deep. This is the issue. I don't think there's really much in this state that threatens democratic control of this state because it is complete and it is dominant and Republicans have been obviously totally complicit in their own self-sabotage. But if there is an issue out there that threatens those majorities and threatens Democrats running this state indefinitely it is this property tax issue and people better pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Patty. Well, David's point is right. We've had, well, 30 years from Tabor that people could talk about problems with Tabor, but we've had two years since the repeal of Gallagher, so there is no reason they couldn't have started working on this earlier. We, of course, knew assessments were going up. We didn't know we would all be living in tents in Krista's very expensive backyard, <laughs> but we knew there had to be a fix. So the fact that they waited so long to really deal with it makes you wonder who is really plotting out the future of the state. We're heading to the 150th anniversary, and this is one big fight that is coming up. There it was a marginal improvement since last week when I was talking about this, which is before, all the money was, any relief was just going to property owners, and the people who didn't own property were going to lose their money, their Tabor refund, or most of their Tabor refund. At least now, those people are not completely screwed, but it is still a very bad deal. And what is also unfortunate is that we are now going to have to talk about it until next November. <laughs> That's right. We sure will. All right, T uh, Title 42, the pandemic era rule the federal government used to reject asylum seekers without hearings expired Thursday, and now the flow of migrants into the U.S. is expected to reach as many as 10,000 people a day, maybe more. Colorado cities are doing their best to cope and prepare. In Denver, Mayor Hancock has reactivated the Emergency Operations Center to assist with the arrival of migrants. Krista. Some of these folks coming over the border are true asylees. They are people who are fleeing uh, bad government or they're fleeing uh, uh, criminals and they, are, they don't get the protection they need for their government. They're, they're persecuted. But a lot of these folks are coming over as economic ma migrants. They want, they want jobs, they want a better way of life. And so they've come here. And I think we, we've got, we're a big country, we've got room for a lot of folks. But there is a, um, a flip side to that in that we don't necessarily have enough shelters for these folks. Um, You've got kids coming into schools that may not be literate, that, that may not speak English. Think about um, the, you know, a teacher in front of 27, 28 kids. If a bunch of them speak different languages, that makes it a lot harder to teach. So the reason that we have an immigration system and a border, basically, is to regulate who comes in here so that we don't overwhelm these services. And I think it comes down not only to, to physically having a secure border with fencing, but also to look at that asylee program. And I would hope our senators from Colorado will look at that program so that only asylees come in through the asylee program and that economic migrants, there is another way for them to apply so that they do not overwhelm our systems. To Krista's point, I'm the son of two people who came to this country as refugees. My sympathies are very much with true refugees from unlivable conditions. But that is not the whole equation here. I don't even think it's the largest part of the equation. Krista made the case, well, any country, any sovereign nation has to control its borders. There is an issue out there that could reelect Donald Trump. I think that's a heavy lift to put Donald Trump back in the White House. I don't think this is a country that wants to do that. But this is the issue that could propel something like that. And Democrats better get it under control. And here in Denver, they're, they're trying to figure out a plan. All the emergency shelters currently are full with people who've already started coming to this country, Patty, and coming to Denver. One of the things, we've, another one, we've known this was coming. When, when 42 was lifted, you knew this would happen. There would be a flood. One of the other issues that we could have dealt with on some level was 
finding a way to let people work, because that's the other thing. They come, a lot of people have said, we would like to work, but legally they can't. And you figure if there had been anything we could do for all these jobs that are going unfilled, we could have figured out a way to let these migrants work. Most of the refugees right now are, are fleeing from Venezuela, which is a communist tyranny. And communism, by its nature, is a system of kleptocracy that is ruled by thieves, where the party steals all the resources from everyone else uh, and, and uh, puts them into de facto slavery. And of course, refugees from communism want to come to free countries like the United States or whatever else is, is available. And yet, at, while this is going on, the Colorado Education Association adopted a resolution uh, saying that, that capitalism is evil. So we've got a win-win solution. All the people who think like those CEA delegates, that America is a terrible country because we're capitalist, we're supposedly racist, they can move, give up their homes to some of the refugees, and they can move to Venezuela and live in the socialist paradise. It's been under the rule of the United Socialist Party since 1999. Everybody will be better off. I like that, because we could have a trade. We could take um, the communists here, the CEA, Miley Cyrus, Donald Trump, and do a trade, and they can go to Venezuela. I can, we could all make a list of, of, hey, here's our trade, you guys get this, and we get hardworking people fleeing communism to come here and ultimately become good American citizens. And Donald Trump is a narcissistic, lawless, strong man, would be a great improvement in the exactly. government of Venezuela. It's, per it's perfect, <laughs> it's perfect. What do you think it's going to be like in Denver this summer? You know, we had those couple of weeks, several weeks in the middle of the winter when we were seeing an influx of people coming to Denver. But now here we are in the summer. Oh, is this going to linger on throughout the summer? Yes, you say so, Krista. Yeah, I think it's just going to be tough because, again, we've got to find room for these folks. Yeah. There's also medical care. Um, all kinds of things and and it really is incumbent on Congress um, and the administration to come up with a better solution. And add on top of that, this is already a city in crisis. This is already a city that's taxed in its carrying capacity in many respects and it just compounds all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about some local politics. The Colorado Springs mayoral runoff is coming up Tuesday. On Monday, Denver City and County runoff ballots will hit the mail. Eric, I will start with you. Well, let's start in Colorado Springs, my old hometown from many, many, many years ago. I actually, in many respects, think that's the more interesting race of the two. I, I keep bumping in or hearing from Republicans, solid, active Republicans in El Paso County, which is still the sort of the heartbeat of the Republican Party in this state to the extent it has a heartbeat. And uh, I'm surprised by the number of them that are supporting Yemi Mobilad. They may be electing him chief executive of that city. We'll see. I mean, Wayne Williams has the old playbook of trying to rally the Republican constituency, but I think that playbook may come up a little short this year. Real quickly on Denver, I think we're now seeing, even though there's not that much difference between these candidates, Kelly Bruff and Mike Johnston, we see how those differences are getting shaped by recent endorsements, police unions, firefighters, whatever, going with Bruff, much more of the sort of progressive democratic establishment going with Johnston. The outlines of this race are now very clear. I would say, Eric, they, they have differentiated themselves through endorsements, through other things, but for the average Denver person out there, they still do not get the difference. In Colorado Springs, you can clearly see the difference between these two candidates. And it does make it an exciting race because they're both really interesting candidates who would be good mayors. I think we could survive either Kelly Bruff or Mike Johnston, but people in Denver really want to make a difference with this vote. They're tired of 12 years of the same administration. They want something new, but they're not sure which one yet. And in the Colorado Springs race, I, Eric, I think your, your points are, are really interesting. I, I would say to the extent that Colorado Springs voters want proven executive competence, Wayne Williams offers that. He was El Paso County Clerk and then Colorado Secretary of State and did a very solid job in running that office in a no drama efficient, uh, money-saving way, and, you know, was, was an outstanding uh, Secretary of State, which suggests he'd probably be a good chief executive uh, for the city as well. In uh, the ninth uh, 
Denver City Council District, there's a runoff with uh, uh, incumbent Candy C. DeBaca, who attracted a lot of controversy. She was at, at a forum. She was asked a question uh, about the issue of reparations, and she said, you could be collecting those extra taxes from white-led businesses all over the city and redistributing them to black and brown-owned businesses. And she said this isn't a plan of something she intends to endorse. Uh, you know, she's not going to bring a bill to do that. However, it is so obviously racist, it makes her visibly unfit to hold public office because our Colorado Constitution forbids racial discrimination. It'll be interesting to see what happens because last week some of the people who are currently on the city council were supporting the person, her challenger. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, elections, uh, it ain't beanbag, as they say, right? There's a lot going on here. I, my hope is for uh, Wayne Williams in Colorado Springs. Just He's just such an awesome person, he's honorable, good guy. I, I don't know his opponent. I'm sure he's a decent person. But the city will be very well run with Wayne Williams at the helm. And then uh, in when it, when it comes to uh, Bruff and Johnston, you know, I'm, I would like to see Bruff for two reasons. One is that I, w I think it would be great for Denver to have uh, the first female mayor. Um, you know, I know, I know that male, female doesn't matter. It really comes down to person's principles and, and character and uh, ideas, but still, it would, it would make me happy. And I also like the fact that she worked for Mayor Hickenlooper back in the day as his chief of staff. Hickenlooper was a wonderful mayor, yeah, and he really oversaw the city going from kind of uh, I'm not going to say backwater. Denver was on the map, but it, under his tenure, it just really became a much more fabulous city. And then it's definitely backtracked in terms of crime and vagrancy and whatnot. So I think having her at the helm, maybe bringing back some of those really good ideas that were under Hickenlooper. And I, you know, but either way, I think the city could have done worse coming out of that first election. Um, either way, I think. There were some people on that list that I thought were pretty scary, so I'm glad they chose two of the best people, and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's start now with our lightning round. Talk about the great, not-so-great stuff that happened in Colorado or elsewhere this week. Let's start on the negatives. We can end on a positive note. Patty. Well, I'm going to continue with the mayor's race. So on Wednesday, we celebrated 10 years of all-male voting in Colorado, third state to adopt it. We have made voting much, much easier, which means people in Denver have no excuse for not studying the issues and voting in June. It's critical. We had just over a third of the voters did it last time. Let's go much higher this time. Yep, we have to. Well, I, I think females should be allowed to vote too, but anyway. <laughs> oh. uh, in, uh, in California, <laughs> they've had a law that for the last 10 years, has forbidden the sale of any new model of pistol. So you can't buy any any new new pistol invented since 2013. Two federal district courts have held that unconstitutional. And this week, a Colorado Attorney General Weiser filed an amicus brief urging the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to uphold that California law banning all new model of pistols, which suggests he's not a gun control advocate. He's a gun prohibitionist. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with a little, I'm going to throw a little shade and a little shame on the legislature, uh, just for all this stupid stuff they did this last, uh, this last session, um, whether it be, I, mean, I talked in the beginning part of the segment about all the bad bills, but I can't honestly think of a single good thing they did, um, so uh, other than adjourn. Um, and I, I hope that voters remember this uh, when this, this next election uh, gives them a chance to do better. I've been away a while, so I'm going to do a very quick two for one. Jesse Paul mentioned last week, but it deserves to be re-mentioned. Colorado Para, managing $66 billion, just sent their CEO packing with zero transparency and zero disclosure of what the problem was. How about a little openness here, guys? And secondly, I woke this morning to a Denver Post headline about Denver Public School Board members now getting paid. Well, if ever there's a group that has certainly earned their salary, that is it. <laughs> I didn't see that headline. <laughs> okay, something positive. Well, we often on this show wind up kind of doing a historic look at the people who've made this state what it is. We just lost Walter Garash, and mm -hmm. he hadn't been practicing law recently, but when there was a cause out somewhere in this state, he was there. Just a fascinating, brilliant character. You're right. There's a new poll that shows only 9% of the people in Denver want to reelect Tay Anderson to the Denver School Board, and 56% are 
are opposed to that, which is no surprise because the schools have been getting worse and worse and worse uh, ever, ever since he's been in office. And so the good news is Kwame Spearman, who's been on this show, has announced he's going to run for that seat against Tay Anderson. And the students and the schools really need someone who's a competent leader rather than a showman. That's also in November, that showdown. Yes. All right. So there's a guy, he pulls a 73-pound lake trout <laughs> out, of a, out of a Blue Mesa Reservoir. He's, he's, um, he's uh, fishing with his son, and his name is Hunter Enlow. And he did a quick weigh on the boat, but that does not going to count if they were to try to set a record uh, the way that they, they did it. But if he were to do it the right way to set a record, it, the fish would have died. He would have had to take it to shore and, 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 and dealt with it. And, and here he is in front of his son. They took a picture. They weighed it really quick, and then he released the fish. Uh, so rather than get the set the record, uh, he set this rather old and large fish uh, free. And way to I guess just way to model to his son responsible fishing. And there's nothing wrong with eating fish, obviously, but this is a huge fish, uh, an old fish, but letting that fish continue to grow and live. So Hunter Enlow, way to go. Okay. Great story. Two journalists locally, Kyle Clark, who in his own very insightful and incisive way really held Jared Polis and others to account on the, the bait and switch, the Peter uh, analogy on property taxes. And on a national level, Caitlin Collins, what a thankless job of trying to moderate a ton, town hall with Donald Trump. But she held her own and she got fact after fact after fact in with the former president. Well done. All right, I have something positive to end the show with as well. A shout out to all of the teachers in Colorado. We hope that you felt love and support from your communities during this Teacher Appreciation Week. You are that constant motivating influence that our kids see every single day. Also, an education note, congrats the class of 2023. Uh, my youngest graduates high school on Sunday. So way to go, both for the graduates and all the teachers for all that you've accomplished this year. Thank you for watching tonight on your TV and device. You can also catch Colorado Inside Out anytime on pbs12.org, YouTube, and Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I am taking some vacation with the fam, so thanks to Krista and Patty in advance for filling in for me these next couple of weeks. I am Kyle Dyer. Thanks for watching, and I will see you again on the first Friday of June here on PBS 12.